hello to Rob Hopkins, who is the co-founder of the Transition Movement. And uh, this is Mike Grenville from uh, Transition Forest Row. So thanks, Rob, for talking to us for International Permaculture Day. This is the first time Pleasure. that's happened. And um, so tell us what inspired you, first of all, to became, become involved in permaculture. How did you get involved in permaculture? I travelled in India and in Pakistan with a, an Australian gentleman called Chris Gwynn who was into permaculture and lived at Crystal Waters Permaculture Village and, uh, and, and every time we went anywhere with apricot trees he got hugely excited <laughs> and wrote little letters back to his local permaculture newsletter about all these exciting things he was seeing. I had no idea what he was talking about at all, uh, but he kept talking about permaculture. And I really left sort of traveling for three or four months with him, none the wiser as to what permaculture was. But then when I got back home, a friend of mine gave me a copy of Bill Mollison's designer's manual and said, I think you might like this, Rob. And, uh, and I took it away and just devoured it and thought it was the most extraordinary thing I'd ever read, a kind of uh, a manual for earth repair. What an extraordinary thing to, uh, to create. How long ago was that? That was in 1992. Right, so you really have been involved in uh, permaculture for quite a long time. So there was a point then when you took a leap and from your deep knowledge then of permaculture, you gave birth to transition. How did, how did that happen? How did it become something else suddenly? Well, I, I did my permaculture design course in 1992 and then I taught uh, and did design work and uh, put in systems and uh, eco-village stuff. You know, I was very, that was basically what I did for a long time and then in 2000 set up the first two-year full-time permaculture course in the world at Kinsale Further Education College, which is still running. Yeah. And um, and so for me, uh, transition really came out of, of of wanting a way of taking permaculture principles and permaculture tools and scaling them up very quickly. I started to get a bit frustrated with uh, the transition, the, the permaculture world as it was then, that I felt had had a number of those tools and insights that needed to be scaled up rapidly mm -hmm. and didn't really feel like it was in any hurry to do that. And in, mm. often there seemed to be a bit of resistance about the very idea of scaling it up somehow. And so for me, that felt like a, that felt like a key thing to do. So in, in some ways, transition was created as a, like a transition, uh, as a Trojan horse into which you can chuck permaculture and all kinds of other stuff and sort of wheel it past everybody while they're not looking and go, oh, it's that transition thing. Uh, but actually inside it is, is, is those tools that we need. Yeah, everybody wasn't ready to become, to be called permies, uh, for example. Well, I think that the, the thing with, with permaculture is that it can be quite a tricky thing to explain to people. If you're down the pub, someone says, ah, Rob, you teach permaculture, what's that all about? You know, <laughs> you need to get out your flip chart pad and your pens and start drawing pictures of chickens and arrows and trees and greenhouses and things, and then it takes a while. Whereas transition is something where you can say, well, what's this place going to look like? How is this place going to function if oil hit $200 a barrel? Yep. You know, what, what, what's that going to look like? How are you going to maintain the basic functions mm. that we need in order to, to do everything that we need and somehow that question is a very very powerful lens through which to look at um, resilience and which can almost sort of lead people to permaculture principles and permaculture thinking from a, from a, from a different direction. Yeah, yeah. So I mean you've written, I was looking, I was, before I was, I was gathering all the books that you've written it started out with the, the, the 12 step transition handbook which um, I first uh, got involved in all that time ago, but, and then you've inspired all these other books. So, you know, the timeline, and so this idea, um, I mean, I'll come back to the timeline, but, you know, for, for um, councils and um, local money and... Uh, well, you've got the full set. Uh, almost, yeah, local <laughs> food. <laughs> and uh, the transition, uh, Totnes, uh, um, energy descent plan, energy descent action plan, rather. And of course, um, the new book just out, um, The Transition Companion, yeah. uh, which I described as kind of going from the original book in black and white to this new kind of full Technicolor version. Um, yes, it's like uh, transition in HD. Yes, it is, and and, and you know that that and, and dropping the twelve-step program, as it were, in the, in that process. Um, so tell us a little bit more about the evolution of, uh, of transition. 
Well, it started out like all good things, I think, as a bit of an accident and a bit of a sort of, um, I think in musical uh, uh, analogy, it's like when you start where you mix two different kinds of music together and then you get a whole new one that comes out of it. You know, if you take this James Brown record and this Led Zeppelin record and you must mess around with them, oh, we've, been, we've created hip-hop and then that's a whole different thing. So originally it was about looking at a response to peak oil informed by permaculture principles, permaculture thinking. Uh, and since then it's really kind of evolved. And so, so from very early on when we started doing Transition Time Top Nest, the first one here, people started coming like yourself and saying, what are you doing? What is this thing? <laughs> how, how do you do it? How does it work? What are you on about? And so we had to, we, we pulled together what we called the 12 steps of transition because it felt like uh, there was some, some powerful similarities with thinking around addiction and that in some ways uh, the literature and the studies around addiction were actually more uh, more um, sophisticated than how the environmental movement had been thinking in terms of change. That kind of body of how, how do you get people to change yeah. was a much more deeply thought through question than it was mm -hmm. uh, in the environmental movement, in the permaculture movement. Yeah. So the 12 steps was kind of useful. People liked having a kind of, oh, we do that bit first, okay, and then we do that. Oh, this is really useful. <clears throat> and the transition handbook was very um, was very popular with that at, at the heart of it. But then after about two years, as more and more bits of the transition handbook started to get a bit out of date, and we felt we needed to to rework it, uh, we went back out. I started the, the the process of researching the transition companion was about going back out to everybody doing transition and saying, so what are you doing actually? I know if, I know you're going to pretend that you're doing the 12 steps, and the, but what are you really doing? You know, and actually they'd say, well, we did the first one and then the third one and then we forgot what the other ones and then we put a couple of other bits in and then we didn't do those next bits because we couldn't figure them out. Or we, you know. And everyone was doing, it, doing their own different version of what transition was. So it felt really important because the spirit has always been transition is an experiment. Everybody gets involved in transition is part of shaping it. It's not cast in stone. It wasn't carried down from Totnes Castle on slabs of stone by a man with a long white beard and a caftan. You know, it was really, it's a living, working, breathing experiment. Yeah. And, um, uh, and so, the, so the, it started to feel more and more like a number of ingredients that actually everybody is assembling transition in their own way. It's as though we invited people to um, to bake the most delicious chocolate cake they ever baked, and in each place they're baking it. There are certain stages to making a delicious cake, and certain things that are in common. And you would call the end product a chocolate cake, but every place is going to bring in its own skills, its own tools, its own extra ingredients, its own embellishments, whatever they need to do in order to feel this is a cake belongs, that belongs to us and to this place and to this culture. Mm. Uh, so transition as it emerges, as it is emerging in Brazil, is distinctly different from transition as it's emerging in Brixton, as it's emerging in Dunbar in Scotland. But they're all distinctly transitioned. So what we tried to do with the new book was to say, well, what are the things, the ingredients that they're using? What are the things that we see people using to address a problem and that acts as a solution enough times for us to say, yeah, that works, that feels part of it. So it's a number of ingredients put together with no sort of, uh, you must do it like this and then this and then this. The people will assemble their own way of doing it. And I think the other thing that we added that's distinct to... The, the transition handbook was the idea of the, the, where this is going is about very intentionally creating a new economic culture for the place that you live. It's about localization, not being a nice woolly idea that we do because it sort of feels like nicer than not doing it, but there is a there is a very strong economic argument for doing localization and that it needs us to get it started. So there's all kinds of ingredients in there about setting up food businesses, setting up all these all different kind of things. So that, that feels like a really key evolution. Yeah. Sounds as though you've really gone back to permaculture principles really, observing what's happened. Yeah, well, when I did my permaculture course, we got handed a copy of Christopher Alexander's Pattern Language quite early on in the course, mm -hmm. and it was almost presented us, to us as a sacred text and uh, and I took I took it home. When you pick it up, you think, "Whoa, this is this is huge! No one's going to be able to read this." But then when the teacher said, "Well, you just go through it. You read the bold bits and look at the pictures." <laughs> Actually, I digested the whole thing in one in, in one night and got a really clear sense of it. And thought, mm. "This is just the most staggeringly brilliant way of looking at things." So, 
Uh, initially, the idea was to do a kind of a transition pattern language, but uh, nobody understood what I was talking about. And so ingredients kind of felt like it was much better. But that, that sort of thinking that Christopher Alexander involved with, evolved with pattern language uh, very much informed and inspired lots of stuff with permaculture, uh, and it feels very much at home in, in transition as well. And in fact, part of the researching for the book was I was really fortunate to get to go and spend a few hours talking to Christopher Alexander, which was uh, which was a real um, real privilege. Great, thank you, Rob. And um, so, and what's your um, message then on International uh, Permaculture Day? <laughs> My message on International Permaculture Day is that permaculture is absolutely fantastic, uh, and it has been the uh, the lens through which I've seen the world for for um, whatever to uh, twenty years, pretty much exactly, yeah. Uh, and uh, for me, what it what it is 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 more than anything, I think, and having taught it for many years, is is a lens through which you see possibilities. And uh, it means that you should... One of my favourite activities I used to do when I taught an evening class in Cork City was that we used to go out and walk around, and it was called um, Permaculture Tour Guides. And the idea was that you would walk around, and one group would look at water, one would, group would look at food, whatever, energy. And then the scenario was it was 20 years in the future, Cork had completely permacultured itself. It was a zero-carbon city, uh, a fantastic living, breathing exemplar of permaculture. And they were tour guides. It had now become people came from all around the world to see this groundbreaking place. And they were the tour guides. They would walk us around and say, and here's this, and here's this, and here's this. And, uh, and that way of looking, where you walk down the street and you, and you see not just some front gardens with lawns in, but you can see the food growing there, you can see the stuff growing up the walls, you can see the potential of it. It's such a powerful thing. And I think that cartoon on the front of the transition handbook really tried to capture that. You know, we see one thing at the moment, but with a permaculture, with your permaculture glasses on, you see you see it very differently and, and, and you see the possibilities. And I think the other thing I always loved about permaculture was that sense that uh, if you want to grow good carrots, do you really need to study soil science for four years to know what good soil is you know do you really need to study horticulture for four years to be able to grow salads for your family it's about distilling down the essence of of, of the things that we really need and i think we try to carry that through uh, into transition but certainly permaculture has been the most incredible um, gift to my life and to spend time among uh, among other people who, who are working on that and driving it forward has been one of the greatest uh, privileges of my life i think that's great, Rob. Thanks very much. That's Rob Hopkins from the Transition Movement. Check out these and all the other videos on permacultureday.info. Thanks very much, Rob. Thank you.